The 1967 Ford Mark IV race car, which of course is an evolution of the GT40 lineage, is one of three cars in GT7 which you actually need to buy to get a particular trophy. And that trophy is a Le Mans Legends related one alongside the Jaguar XJ13 and the Ferrari P4. Now, in previous games, GT6 and GT Sport, that would have been quite the undertaking, because they were 20 million each. Now, in one of the relatively rare occasions where Haggerty turns out to be a blessing, it's actually about 6.7 million, which is a hell of a lot easier to afford, and strangely is now, what, a similar price to something like a Mercedes CLK LM, which sounds kind of crazy when you put it that way, but it certainly helps to get the trophy. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the Mark IV Ford first, though, is because it actually ties in quite nicely to the Sponsor of this episode? Huh? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No. It's a Diagostini for DD40. Now, as many of you know, I don't typically work with sponsors here on the channel, and the reason why is simple. Regardless of how lucrative the offers sometimes are, if they don't make sense to my audience, I just don't do them. This is an exception, because Diagostini, a company who's been around since the late 50s and made a ton of these collectible kits, offered me the chance to do their 1.8 scale Ford GT40 in possibly the most iconic racing livery of all time, Golf Colors. Now, as you can tell, it's a pretty big model. In fact, it's 1.8 scale. And what that means in practice is a nearly two foot long model, 51 centimeters long, weighing in eight kilos, about 17 and a half pounds for our American friends with working lights and sounds as well. And as you move forward with the kit, not only did they show you how to build it, but they also get into the history of the car. History such as how it got started with Lola's involvement. And naturally, instructions on how to build the kit. Kind of important. And I even asked them if they would be okay with me building this kit on a month-to-month -month basis here on the channel, and they said yes. So if you were to get the GT40, you can actually build it along with me. Another thing that I love about these kits is that if you check out the online prices of fully built ones, there's something of an investment anyway. So not only are they great for a collector and a hobbyist, but you can potentially make your money back many times over once they are fully made. And it's a much more affordable investment than, well, an actual GT40. If then you would like to check out this model, you can use a promo code, which they've kindly sent me here, and of course click the link right below this video to jump over to their website and check out all of the additional bonus features, depending on how you choose to pay and what kind of bundle you go for. And with that being said, special thanks to Diogostini for reaching out. Well, that was something a bit different. Don't exactly do sponsors that often, but for those who do want to check it out, it's a pretty cool little project. Now, back to the Ford Mark IV. This car, and many of my thoughts on this car, are going to be very similar to what they were in GT6 and GT Sport. So for those who are new to the series, and Gran Turismo 7 maybe was your first game, this will probably be relatively new information, especially if you haven't bought the car yet. So what do you need to know before getting into it, if you don't really care about that trophy, is it even worth buying any of the three cars, and maybe if you only want to buy one or two of them, which one should you go for? Well. The Mark IV, I would say, is probably the weaker of the three. That's no slight against the car, because it's still very good, it's just that the other ones are even better, at least in my opinion. Now for me, if I could only choose one of the three, it would be the Jag, hands down. I love the XJ13, it looks the part, sounds the part, it's got good power, good weight, and it's a very strong all-rounder. The Ferrari has a huge advantage on weight, especially over this one, and I would say that the Ferrari is probably the best overall through corners. In fact, the Ferrari P4 feels the most similar out of these three to a modern prototype. It has very modern-esque you know, super lightweight, pinpoint accurate steering, and you can feel that instantly. This one is not without its merits, though. You see, this one handles more like, I would say, kind of a touring car. It's got a bit of a long tail vibe, it weighs a bit more, it's one metric ton, which is a thousand kilos. So compared to like the Ferrari, which is, I want to say, what, 760, 770 kilos, something like that, if I recall correctly, that's a pretty big disparity between the two. This does have decent power and good torque though, 503 horses straight off the bat, and even the point level actually isn't that high, it's 707. So that means in real terms, within career mode, you could quite easily just add a little bit of weight, 
and maybe recoup it even with a little bit of power, depending on how you tune it, and get this thing into the 700 point Lamar cash cow event. So feasibly, you could well use this car to pay for itself. Now you may well be able to do that with the other two as well, if you so choose, but it is at the very least a point in this car's favour. I mean, it already makes it better than a lot of Vision GTs and electric cars. With those specs in mind though, what's it actually like to drive? Well I already mentioned that the Ferrari is much sharper, the Jaguar is very smooth and good as an all-rounder, this one I would say really does have that touring car kind of vibe. This is honestly the car of the three that I believe would be the least taxing to drive over a literal endurance race. If you were going to have something like a 248, anything up to like 24 hour endurance race within Gran Turismo 7, say like an online event, and you were gonna race classics within whatever point level, this is the one that I feel like you could just go lap after lap after lap, and you probably wouldn't make many mistakes because there's nothing about this car which really surprises you. The handling is very predictable. When it steps its tail out, it's very predictable. It almost feels just a little bit delayed, really, in all of its reaction times. Like, it does everything like the other two, but just a fraction of a second after they would do it. So it's not quite as sharp, not quite as twitchy, not quite as fast sometimes, but that's not necessarily always a bad thing. And I would say another example of that is when I mentioned that same kind of vibe in my review of the Mercedes CLK LM. Similar price to this thing in the Haggerty collection, of course a returning face. That has really pleasant, smooth, again touring car-esque handling, which over a long event or even just a long circuit like the Nürburgring, it's a real pleasure to work with because it's just smooth, it's consistent, and it's not that you can't make a mistake, of course, you always can, but it's a pretty damn forgiving car. This definitely has that vibe as well. The handling, as I said, it's smooth, you can step the tail out, and again, it's a 1967 car, so you can't expect it to handle like a modern machine. However, I think it actually handles itself pretty well for its age, especially when most classics tend to really only have one advantage over modern cars, and that is typically their weight. Something like the Ferrari is far lighter than even a modern LMP car. This doesn't even have that advantage, so to still feel good is a testament to it being a genuinely good car, and that at the very least is consistent between the last three games. Seven, Sport, and six, the car has felt pretty damn consistent, consistently the slowest of the three, if you want to think of it that way, but still consistent nonetheless. This car actually reminds me very much of my personal feelings on the Panos, the Esperante GTR one race car which we last saw in GT6. I know that many of you, like myself, are big fans of the Panos, it was always that oddball car. It wasn't represented correctly in terms of weight anyway within the game, but it was always that choice which had smoother, more predictable, more forgiving handling, again, very touring car or GT car-esque. It was really the ugly duckling of the whole GT1 class. Totally different layout, totally different vibe. This really feels like the classic equivalent of that, which is kind of ironic given that the panels is Ford-powered, after all, so it kind of has that connection there. This one has, speaking of which, a pretty big engine as well, which adds to the weight. Overall, I would say that my thoughts on this compared to the Jag and the Ferrari is actually that each of the three, despite being great rivals to each other, have a very distinctly different vibe. The Ferrari, in my opinion, feels the most like a modern prototype class race car. The Jag feels the most like a modern supercar would. This feels the most like a muscle car out of the three. It's got that lazy torque, the big capacity, higher weight, but everything's just a little bit smoother, a little bit chunkier, a little bit heavier in its movement and in its flow, which, at the very least in my experience, makes it a pretty damn nice car to work with over the course of a long event. So ultimately, it's down to you which one you go for, or even get all three if you want the trophy, but that's it for my thoughts on the Ford Mark IV at least, and we'll probably talk about the other two in due time. But of course, give me your thoughts down below. What do you think of the Mark IV? And of course, what do you think of the other two as well? But until next time, I'll see you then with more reviews. And of course, as always, thanks for watching.